Now, I would like to turn to our speaker, who is an associate professor of theology at Duquesne University and an assistant priest at Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church in Pittsburgh, Father Radu Ordeyanu. He and his research focuses on ecumenical dialogues and various teachings of the church. He is the author of Dimitri Semiloe and Ecumenical Ecclesiology, and also the editor of It Is the Spirit Who Gives Life, New Directions in Pneumatology. He served as president of the Orthodox Theological Society of America and is currently a member of the North American Orthodox Catholic Theological Consultation, the official dialogue between the two churches. He is a co-convener of the Christian Jewish Dialogue in Pittsburgh and is involved in local ecumenical dialogues. That we may better understand Christian upbringing and the church as a family. It is my privilege, privilege to ask that you join me in welcoming this year's esteemed lecture, Father Radu from Puerto Rico. for that uh, generous introduction, uh, your Agnes, Reverend Fathers, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, dear guests watching this lecture online, thank you very much for your invitation. I am honored and I have been looking forward to this moment for a long time. I've sat in those chairs when the illustrious speakers before me came and I didn't wait until this moment when we could talk about the church as a family and the family as a church. This is a subject that is very dear to me because ecclesial experience is tightly close to the family. A person has a Christian identity from the moment of their conception, or in a way, even before that, as the parents desire to have a child and they pray to have a child. They also intend to baptize that child into the church. So in a way, there is a baptism of desire already happening even before the moment of conception. So they have a Christian identity by anticipation. Even before baptism, when somebody literally becomes a member of the church, the community prays for them. And then after baptism, that person begins to grow in the faith, to pray, to go on the way to salvation, especially within the family. And because that upbringing happens first and foremost in the family, St. John Chrysostom described the house as a little church. This is what I propose that we discuss today. Uh, the outline of my lecture includes two sections. The first one is on the house as a little church. Older than the girl, and they have a dog, and that's the family. 
doesn't always work like that. My family, for example, has three children. And uh, also, let's, uh, uh, let us acknowledge that many families actually go through the tragedy of divorce. About 160 million Americans are affected directly by a divorce when you consider the effects it has upon the children, not only about, uh, not only about the parents. Let's also acknowledge that some families are abusive and destructive. And so this metaphor might not work for people who come from this kind of uh, families. And also, to finish more, uh, not finish, I'm not done yet, but to explain the family in a, a more positive note, uh, let us acknowledge that sometimes parents want children and God does not give them that gift. Uh, let us acknowledge that uh, some families include single parents, some families include adopted children, foster children also, and I personally have a great appreciation for parents who adopt children, uh, because I myself have three children, and I know how difficult it is to raise children, especially good children, but also uh, because in the scriptures it speaks about um, brothers and sisters of Christ. And they probably came from a previous marriage of Joseph, which makes Virgin Mary their stepmom. And when you think of Virgin Mary as a stepmother, this puts a very positive light on what it means to have a family that does not always go according to that um, uh, image of the family that I have described before. So, as we talk about the, uh, the family, let us acknowledge from the beginning that uh, the New Testament speaks about the church as a household or as a family. The Bible describes the church as a family and the family as a little church, as we shall see momentarily in a quote from Ephesians. And Ephesians describes Paul. Uh, Ephesians describes the church as a household of God in which all members are part of the same family, the holy temple and the dwelling place for God by the Spirit, as you can see in the quote that is on the screens. Now, Jesus promised his disciples that where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. First of all, when the disciples heard these words, they were extremely surprised. Because a rabbi in the old same era, Hananiah ben Gerabion, said something very similar. He said, where two sit together and the words of the law are spoken between them, the Shekinah rests between them. The Shekinah being the presence of God. So where two or three are gathered to read the Torah, the word of God, the presence of God is among them. And now Jesus says that He is the so he is God, as Christians were saying. Now, early Christians, such as St. Clement of Alexandria, is wondering who are the two or three. In his mind, the three mean husband, wife, and children. And so when these live together according to the will of God, Christ himself is present because the family is the dwelling place. So the family is a church. That's what the church is, the dwelling place of God. So now, let's look a little bit at the service of marriage. And this is not in my parish. But here, you see a picture of two people being led by the priest who's holding the gospel. And I'd like you to already look at the crowns that they have that are tied with a ribbon between them. I'm coming back to that in just a second. But first, let me say that the service of marriage it prints upon the couple the idea that they are priests of their own family. They are led by the book of the gospel and they make their first steps in the footsteps of the gospel, led by the church. As we sing three hymns that involve the prophets, the majesty of God and the martyrs, emphasizing the prophetic, the kingly and sacrificial calling that the spouses have one towards another. It's very interesting to note that these same hymns, though in reverse order, are sang at the sacrament of ordination. And you see now in the next slide, 
uh, an ordination that actually took place in my own parish, in which the priests are taking the candidate for ordination around the altar table, like the priest of marriage takes the candidates around the sacramental table, and these hymns are being sang as that young man, in this case the son of our parish, has been made uh, a priest. And so the spouses begin, they make their first step literally, as husband and wife, their first step is according to the song of ordination to the priesthood, because they themselves now have their crowns tied to one another. It means that they are especially responsible for each other, that they're responsible for each other's salvation, and that they're saved together. Those two crowns which symbolize just like the crowns of the saints in heaven. You, did you know that all icons have saints uh, depicted with crowns, right, with a halo? And so now their crowns are tied to one another because they are going to be saved together. They have a priestly mission one towards another. This priestly mission then is continued in Christian upbringing in the way in which they raise their children. And you'll see in the next slide uh, an icon of the presentation of the Lord to the temple in Jerusalem. When Jesus was 40 days old, according to the Jewish tradition, he was then presented by Virgin Mary, by Joseph, to the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, rich families were supposed to have enough money to buy a lamb and sacrifice the lamb, but Joseph and Virgin Mary were very poor, or they could afford, were two turtle doves. And that's how they dedicated the Savior of the world, the King of Kings, to the temple when he was 40 days old. And at that time, Prophetess Anna was there, and righteous Simeon, who received baby Jesus in his arms, and he said the prayer, Master, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before all peoples. Something very similar happens in the Orthodox Church at 40 days after the birth of a baby. Because there, the priest takes the baby, we go into the front of the church, uh, before entering into the church proper in the Northeast, and after, after a few prayers, we take the babies in our arms, by the way, it's really cool to be a priest, right? Because you carry other people's babies in your arms. This is really, really nice. And so you take somebody's baby in your arm, and you go into the church, and uh, if you could click, please, uh, you will see that the prayer is, the servant of God, Paul, could you please click a little bit on the uh, slide? So the servant of, uh, no, I had some more things on the previous slide. There we go. The servant of God, and there you pronounce the name, is churched in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then we say this prayer as we go into the church, and then we go inside the altar with these baby boys and these baby girls, and we say the same prayers, the servant of God, so and so, is a church in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the priest comes out to the front of the church where the parents have now followed, and we recite the prayer, now let your servant depart in peace. So at this point, as a priest, I am Simeon, righteous Simeon, who says this prayer. So place this baby in my arms. Jesus. And this is why this service, service which is closely related to the service of baptism, emphasizes the idea that the newly baptized is properly called Christ. That's a quote there from St. Cyril of Jerusalem who speaks about those baptized because in baptism we become Christ. In the way in which the Bible put it in Galatians, for example, all those who have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. It means you become Christ or you become a member of the body of Christ says the same thing. And this is why we are probably called Christ if we are baptized members of the body of Christ. This is what the Christian upbringing that begins in the family shows. It shows that the father and the mother bring their child as an offering to God so that that child will be properly called Christ. This is priesthood, right? The priesthood that begins in the family 
because the family is a living church. Let me now move on to speak about the parents' responsibility of Christian upbringing of their children, of offering them to God in other ways as well. The church of the, the, church of the baby impresses strongly on the parents that as faithful members of the church, they have the responsibility of Christian upbringing. However, that Christian upbringing and offering continues in numerous other ways. One example, and all of us who are married and have little children, we know that, although I will admit I don't know it as well as my wife, it is extremely difficult to get a bunch of babies and little children to church, right? It is a miracle if they all have shoes. Not really, one of them will have only one shoe. Ha, dear. <laughs> so, it is really difficult, right? As a priest, I have to go early, so my wife had to do that with three children most of the times. When we travel, I am so impressed because I have to participate in that. But many of us here have read, read Alexander Schmemann. And we know that in the early church, the literature did not begin only in the church temple proper. The literature really began with a procession around the city, and it is called the sacrament of the assembly, when people were joining this procession, and then there was the entrance. Today, the entrance is part of that, uh, and please pardon my language, liturgical U-turn with the gospel, where you pick up the gospel from the holy table, go outside and put it right back, right? <laughs> but in those times, they carried it. That's why it's called liturgical U-turn. But in those times, the Bible was kept uh, outside of the church and carried in procession, and at the doors of the church, not the doors of the altar, because the sacred space is the church, it's not just the altar, right? They would then come in the entire community. What has happened before that is the sacrament of the assembly. And so, parents who are struggling to bring their children to church, please know that what we are doing is sacramental. It is literally part of the liturgy. It is the sacrament of the assembly, if this is any consolation. Now, moving on to the next point, Let's admit that all of us, men and women, fathers, mothers, we are equally endowed by God to care for our children. And yet, and yet, statistically speaking, that is not the case. In, in fact, four in ten adults say that their parents did not exercise this calling equally, one bearing more responsibility than the others, and in most cases, the more responsible parent was the mother. The gap is even larger in families where the parents belong to two different religions, in which case the mothers are almost seven times more responsible for the religious upbringing of their children than fathers. And these statistics show us that the most effective priest in the family is the mother. Let me repeat that, and you shall see it on the screen soon. The most effective priest in the family is the mother. So dear fathers present here, let's step up. We have a sacred duty. We are bringing these children into the world, and we are not doing our Christian duty of raising them in the church. Those of you who are going to be in parishes, please inspire the fathers in your parishes to be good Christian fathers because they have a lot of catching up to do. As you do that, please also be compassionate. It is extremely difficult to be a parent, especially in these days. Most of the times, both parents work. They have really unsustainable work schedules. The children have numerous extracurricular activities. They might be going to a very demanding school, and there at that demanding school, they have undue curricular burdens. And we, as priests, 
as Christian brothers and sisters have the duty to support each other and to emphasize these as truly family values. That's what true value and family value is when you tell people be a good priest in the household church that uh, you are there, uh, a parent in which God has put you as a parent. Because again, at this point, the most effective priest in the family is the mother. And fathers do not have an equal role. Now let me continue with some statistics that we shall see are simply astounding. But then these community 
is multiplied, and as they multiplied, so did the number of leaders in the, each one of these communities, which again are bishops. And then some of them tended to spread out in the countryside, and for a while we had the phenomenon of uh, four bishops, four episcopal, right? Uh, village bishops, kind of. But then, gradually, by the third century, most communities were what we call today a parish that was led by a priest. The bishop would be the head of the diocese that included smaller communities that were led by priests and that's where the Eucharist was mainly ha was, was happening on a regular basis. Okay. Alexander Schmemann observes that the process which transformed the original episcopal structure of the local church into what we know today as parish, although it represents one of the most radical changes that ever took place in the church, remain strange as it may seem, virtually unnoticed by ecclesiologists and canonists. To the point to which today, a good friend of mine, who recently passed away, that rest his soul, Tom Damon, uh, uh, organized a symposium and then edited a book entitled, What is a Parish? It has a question mark in here, right? So it's not like, let me tell you what a parish is, but rather, what is a parish? Because there are some very brief canonical uh, references to the parish in the uh, Catholic canon law, in the Roman Catholic canon law. We were flocks. We don't know how to speak about the parish theologically because for us, every Episcopal assembly is the local church and the bishop is the sole celebrant of the liturgy gathering the entire diocese. I have never been to a liturgy in which the bishop gathered the entire diocese and there was only one liturgy. And so there is the necessity for us to speak uh, practically about the role of the bishop in today's reality, and the bishop has many ministries. I wasn't planning on saying these things, but since you're here, I'm mentioning them right now. Uh, meaning that the bishop has the uh, ministry of uh, unity, of connection with other dioceses, of appointing priests in the parish. Right? But then the great unknown remains, what is a parish? And so, you'll see in the next slide how I am proposing a definition of the parish as a community of the faithful gathered together around a priest for the celebration of the Eucharist and other services, for being an instrument of the kingdom of God, bringing healing and proclamation of the good news to their locality and the world in general, and for exercising the various charisms for its members for the building up of the body of Christ. So here I'm emphasizing the idea that there are aspects of the church that are not included in the Eucharist, that the parish is the natural place of Eucharistic celebration, and the reality that parishioners on a regular basis experience the Eucharist celebrated by the priest, of course, with the blessing of the mission. So now, how does the typical American join a parish? In other words, how do you become a member of the parish? Forgive me for being so direct, but there is a little process of shopping around. Yes? And after a little bit of process of shopping around, people discern elements such as musical preferences. This parish has better music than the other parish. These are not bad things, right? It's important for us in parishes to have good music. The quality of sermons. People join Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church where I am a priest because I am the assistant who preaches only rarely. <laughs> and because four members of my family are part of the choir. So you see, those two things are already taken care of. I step aside for the sermons and my family sings. Another reason is ethnicity. Other people uh, join parishes based on age. Like we have little children, we want good uh, children's ministries, right? Things like that. Uh, and then they register as members. But the number of registered members is far greater than the number of faithful who regularly attend services and are involved in ministries. An even greater number is that of adherents who identify as Orthodox, whether they're registered or not. For example, a recent study of American Orthodoxy shows that the total number of adherents is slightly under 800,000. That's a very small number. You know, an orthodoxy that is used to being in the majority in every country, right? Like in Greece, 99.999% are orthodox. But here we are under 800,000 
And uh, that is a very small number. If you want to hear an even smaller number of these, 209,000 attend regularly. That, my dear friends, is a percentage of 26%. Much greater than in traditional Orthodox countries. In Russia, attendance at its best is about 7%. For us, 26% on average, that's a really good percentage. But compared to American average, which is 51%, this is actually not enough. So may I take your joke? All right. Please laugh politely when I'm done. I'll see you. <laughs> a city was invaded by squirrels. And in the city there were three churches. A Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, and an Orthodox church. And each church had to get rid of the squirrels. So the Methodists, who have a committee for absolutely everything, they formed the Squirrel Committee. And the Squirrel Committee decides to catch those animals, take them 50 miles away, liberate them in the wild, and two weeks later they were back. The Presbyterians looked at the writings of John Calvin, who spoke intensely about predestination, and they came to the conclusion that squirrels are predestined to be in their yards. The Orthodox baptized the squirrels in the Orthodox Church, and since then the squirrels appear only on Easter and Christmas. For <laughs> 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 the Christmas, right? Have you heard the expression Christmas? There we go, that's the one. But leaving this aside, there are many factors that go into percentage of church attendance. For example, when a parish is under 25 members, church attendance is close to 70%. When a parish has more than 2,000 members, church attendance is about 15%. You see a difference of 55%. The greatest drop in church attendance happens when a parish grows above 100 and 50 main members. But the size of the parish does not explain everything. Sometimes there are cultural differences because, for example, attendance in Greek and Serbian churches is much lower than uh, attendance in Antiochian and OCA parishes. And so there are differences in culture like that. So a smaller parish tends to have better church attendance. And this is why when I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, there was an Antiochian church close to us which grew beyond 150 members and then it decided we're well, going to start a mission church. And after it started the mission church, that one grew uh, more and they started another one, right? Which is good if you have priests, if you have the financial means. If you don't have enough priests, if you don't have the financial means, it's not a practical, uh, there is no practical way of implementing that, but this is the ideal. So now let's talk about the members of the parish who are active. Uh, I will not insist on our daily ministries, but I wanted to mention the priest who has, first of all, a teaching ministry, that is preaching. And there in the picture you see me writing my sermon. Then the priest is also the spiritual father of the parish. So he is the leader, right? People come to him for uh, confession, for advice, for uh, just direction in life. And he's the celebrant of the liturgy together with the faithful, again, uh, appointed there by the bishop. Many parishes have permanent deacons, especially nowadays in Antiochian and Oski parishes, although Greeks are trying to uh, gradually catch up with that. But then I would like to say a few more things, actually, about the other ministries that are not ordained. And these oftentimes are inspired to then be active in the parish, to lead ministries. So I remember being in graduate school and being told by my professor to visit churches and to look at their bulletin to see what activities they have beyond Sunday. In other words, are you a seven day a week church or are you a one day a week church? And these ministries cannot be done all by the priest, right? Because that would be a bottleneck model where everything has to be funneled through the priest and it somehow gets stuck. No, rather people have to be empowered so that they participate in these ministries and that they lead these ministries. Having said this, not all ministries are equal. 
As you see up there, in descending order of importance for the youth, the most important one for them is fellowship groups and then theology and contemporary issue study groups and classes. Other things that we might intuitively think, oh, they really want to travel together, that ranks last in their preferences. So it's important to see what actually brings fruit. And it's important to also empower people, like I said before, to have these ministries, because the ministries are gifts. They are characters with which God endows the members of the body as instruments through which God Himself works. The gifts He gave were that some of the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for rebuilding the body of Christ until all of us come to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. In other words, each and every person has a specific role. All of us are charismatics in the true sense of the word. Some are ordained, some are not ordained, some are delegated, such as parish council, some are not delegated. But all of us are charismatics. This might be far away from what we see in some parishes in which many Christians are just comfortably in the pews on Sunday. First of all, they really have to very in the pews. That's not what I meant. But what I meant is, what is your role when you come to church, right? Each person has to ask themselves that question. And remember that there are churches where 40 or 50 people. I don't know how many of you served in parishes that were 40 or 50 uh, large. I did. I used to be in a mission church in Greenville, North Carolina. And one day, an absolute disaster happened. The only person who knew how to make coffee was not there. <laughs> It was one of these big things, I thought I know how to make coffee, because you know, I'm the one who makes coffee, not coffee at home. By the way, gentlemen, you know that you are supposed to make the coffee in the family, right? That's what the Bible says. There's an entire book in the Bible that says that you, not your wife, you make the coffee. And that book in the Bible is called Hebrews. <laughs> Especially that I'm speaking to so many seminarians here, when you go into a parish, your role is not to do everything, your role is to also, in, also, I say, also identify the charisms that the people have, maybe help them discern those charisms, and ask them, ask them to participate in church life. The next slide you'll see things that are happening in my parish, for example, or in parishes that I know very closely, and these are just women's ministries, there are other ones that also men are doing. Here are some of the ministries they have. Visitation of the sick and the elderly. It's amazing how many shelters they have. It's amazing how many people who cannot come to church and they are visited regularly by the ladies in our parish and they take gifts and they ask other people in the parish to take gifts to these people because that's our duty to be right there with members of our parish. They are Sunday school teachers, coordinators, spiritual mothers. Do you know how often people go to the holier women in our parish? And I'm not exaggerating, holier women in our parish. Women that I regard as holy. And ask for advice. And ask for direction. How to live a Christian life. They are members of the parish council. Participate in church governance. They are creepers, youth coordinators, tour guides. Readers of liturgical services, iconographers, secretaries, presbyteries, they sing in the church choir, lead Bible studies, and so forth. These are all several ministries in which uh, especially women can be involved. And so, a parish has to be outward looking. A parish has to be focused on ministries that serve the world. I'm going to get a little bit more ecumenical now and quote John Wesley, the founder of Methodist. Methodism. He was preaching in the field, and the local pastors criticized him. What are you doing here? This is not your parish. And his reply was, the world is my parish. It became the motto of the missions in the Methodist church. And so we have to look at it the same way. The world is my parish. As much as the liturgical confines, 
is not just my folks, but the entire world is my parish. And also, again, as a word of caution to those of you who are preparing for ordination, do not let the parish be your whole world. The world is my parish. Do not let the parish be your whole world. It has to go beyond that. Then I'm going to quote Pope Francis. He says that I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. I do not want a church concerned with being at the center in which it then ends by being caught up in a web of obsessions and procedures. Rather, his vision includes a poor church for the poor in which the bishops and priests have the smell of the sheep. Like that quote. I do not often quote popes, but when they agree with the point I just made, then yes, it's the right place to quote the pope. So now, let me move on and speak about different kinds of members in the parish, namely those who are in mixed marriages. There are significant advantages, of course, to being that you have marriages between two faithful of the same church. I have here with, for you a quote from Tertullian to his wife. So Tertullian wrote to his wife. And you will see there that he speaks, for example, of the advantage where both are brethren, um, both are brethren, both fellow servants, no difference of spirit or flesh. Nay, they are truly two in one flesh. Where the flesh is one, one is the spirit two. Together they pray, together prostrate themselves, together perform their fasts, mutually teaching, mutually exhorting, mutually sustaining equally are they both found in the Church of God equally at the banquet of God. Most of these actually apply to our intra-Christian marriages that are mixed marriages, except for the one about being equally members at the banquet of God. In our current state, we have not arrived to the point where uh, the spouses in all churches are allowed to receive communion together, although in some churches they are allowed to receive communion together. And so, yes, there are parish, parish uh, marriages that are of people of, two, uh, of exactly the same thing, but then mixed marriages are a significant reality in our lives. So here are some of the challenges that mixed marriages encounter. If an Orthodox or a Catholic is married to an Evangelical Christian, and here I speak like somebody has been a priest for five years in North Carolina, they really have to talk about whether they were baptized babies. I remember doing a premarital counseling once, in which I asked the two spouses, future spouses, in which church are we going to baptize our children? And the Orthodox one goes, oh, definitely Orthodox. And the Baptist one goes, baptized? Because it's not baptized babies in their church. That's what they want, don't you think? Then we go to blessed homes and they don't have any icons. Because the evangelical spouse does not allow for icons or devotion for vir to Virgin Mary and to saints. But then there are marriage, mixed marriages in general, and especially as leaders in parishes, we have to be aware about various challenges that they find. Namely, for example, they are unable to, unable to commune together. Uh, they are unable to offer exactly the same children's religious education. They might attend Bible studies in different churches. When it comes to charitable ministries, they have to divide their, uh, um, their resources. When it comes to sporting churches, they have to do the same. Uh, the calendar is particularly important for many of us. And you see there the sign in the First Baptist Church. That's a real sign where they say, uh, we want to be worthless, but can figure out the calendar. And it's a significant issue because the parishioners that I know who are in mixed marriages, they would go and celebrate Easter with their own Catholic family. But that was Palm Sunday for us. When they do that, they break the fast. Let's be honest. They break the fast. And so we really have to get, first of all, some things in order. Second of all, we have to be aware of the kind of difficulties that we put for these mixed couples. And again, let's be direct. We make those difficulties. 
Then it is already hard enough. And we should be walking with them at every point. But oftentimes we make it even harder. By introducing divisions like these, by introducing difficulties like these, we have a sacred duty to overcome these divisions amongst ourselves. And this is why, as you heard in Father Christian's uh, presentation, I am dedicated to the Orthodox Catholic dialogue so that none of these would be an issue among us, at least, uh, from now on, and we'll be better equipped to minister to mixed marriages. It is difficult to be in a mixed marriage, in a mixed marriage, because statistically speaking, spouses that are currently in religious and mixed marriages are less religious compared to homogenous marriages. When comparing the frequency of worship attendance, prayer, belief in God, and self-description of the importance of religion in one's life, between 51 and 54 percent are highly religious in the first group, compared to 77 percent in the second group. Moreover, mixed couples discuss religious matters less frequently than there is religiously matched marriages. And do you remember what happens when parents don't discuss religion at home? Their children's chances of coming into the church drop by 50 percent. So once again, our disunity is hurting people in a very real way. In the United States, 25% of Christian marriages are mixed. Depending on what's happening in your churches, these numbers might seem too small, but these are the numbers for the entire country. 9% of these marriages are between spouses of different religious affiliation, and 50% between one spouse that is religiously affiliated and the other one who is not. And by the way, aren't these 15% of marriages such a great opportunity for mission? Because you're not snatching faithful for another, from another church, but rather a person who is not involved in their church but comes into a Christian marriage now has the opportunity to see what Christian life really is. This number of mixed marriages is only going to grow. And you see the, the comparison between the silent and greatest generations, where only 13% of them are in mixed marriages, to the millennial generations, where 27% are in mixed marriages. I was telling you earlier that orthodoxy is a very small minority in the United States, about 800,000 people. And so, of course, we're going to have more mixed marriages. In the United States, about 69% of marriages involving in Orthodox are mixed marriages. For us, mixed marriages are the norm. They're not the exception. And even when those spouses are Orthodox, one of them might actually be a convert. Because in churches like the OCA, 51% are converts. In churches like the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, 29% are converts. As a matter of fact, speaking of the OCA, 59% of the clergy are converts. 59% of the clergy in the Orthodox Church of America are converts. And so, the kind of families that we are ministering to are ecumenical in character. Their children are raised in a dialogical spirit. If we continue with our intra-church quarrels, they are not going to understand anything. Only our people don't understand why we are divided. It's going to be even less so in mixed families where they say mom loves dad and dad loves mom. They're a different face and look how they're making it work. Why can't you guys make it work? It's possible, right? So they stand as judgment upon us. Another interesting thing about mixed marriages is that, yes, sometimes spouses will stay at different churches for the entirety of their lives. I have some of these in my marriage. Other times, there are two important moments where one of the spouses is more likely to convert. One of them is around the sacrament of marriage. By the way, from pastoral experience, I would say that I don't necessarily recommend that one. There's a certain amount of pressure to convert, and conversion should not happen like that. We don't want mediocre converts, right? We want really the good ones. And so the next moment comes somewhere before the first child that is 10. And you understand why it's happening then? Because they have to speak with one voice to that child about faith. And so, let us look at the families in our parishes, see the kind of age that their children have, and listen to their desire to be one, together in the same faith, and to uh, respond to that. And when we're talking about uh, conversion, 
Please don't take that for, uh, for granted, because an ecumenical parish has to seek to embrace those who want to convert. The alternatives for converts are endless in the United States. Some researchers speak about the spiritual marketplace. Get that spiritual marketplace in which people can choose, and the truth is that about half of adult Americans have changed their religious affiliation at least once in their lives. This kind of situation is very different from traditional Orthodox countries. In a traditional Orthodox country, a parish is the community of those who share the same faith and receive communion together. Not in the United States. In the United States, I have parishioners who are not Orthodox, who come and listen to sermons every Sunday, who participate in the charity of the church, who volunteer in the ministries of the church, who are not baptized Orthodox or chrismated Orthodox. Because a parish in the United States does not assume that everybody believes the same things and is part of the same sacramental life fully. Of course, to a great degree, yes, but not fully. And so a parish is ecumenical in character here where we live. Which brings me to the last two categories of people that I want to discuss as members of our parishes. And I'm saying the last two categories just to give you hope that I'm just about done. But I still have a few more minutes. So, let's talk about cultural Christians. We have to begin from the idea that once a person is baptized, that person is always baptized. Let's go to the previous one, cultural. There, thank you. So, once a person is baptized, they're always baptized, correct? How do you receive back into the church a person who went and embraced their non-Christian faith? Through chrismation. Not through pre-baptism. Because once baptized, they're always baptized, correct? How about the people who left the church? Are they still baptized? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And so, in the United States, there are 9% who, who do not regard themselves as active members of the Catholic Church anymore. And yet, they find a way of calling themselves cultural Catholics. That's actually a scholarly category, but they are cultural Catholics. What does it mean, cultural Catholic? These are people who are no longer coming to church, but they tell you, I was raised Catholic. Do you see their identity? Because they say, I was raised Catholic. They still regard themselves as Catholic by culture, ethnicity, and family tradition. So, I don't really believe in this church thing, but my child will go to First Communion, right? Uh, more than a third of them occasionally go to Mass, actually, and would want the sacrament of the anointing of the sick if they were ill. Forty-three percent of them are opening, open to returning to the church someday. Sixty-three percent of these cultural Catholics participate in Catholic Masses, baptisms, weddings, funerals, feast days or other events, even if they don't believe in them. But why? Because it's important to their families and friends. In other words, if you are a grandmother, it is your duty to call all your children, your grandchildren to church as a way to celebrate your birthday. You see what you've done there? Nobody says no to none. <laughs> they might not believe in the whole changing thing of the bread and wine to the blood and blood of Christ. But they believe that only mama can put the way she does and they have to make her happy. So they come to church with mama because that's what she said. And you know what? If they have a good experience, isn't that where our mission should begin? Because they're already culturally ours. It's about bringing people back. When that happens, we don't tell them all what I have in me. We love them and we embrace them. Don't invite people and then tell them, go. Invite them and embrace them. So they should be the immediate focus of our outreach, cultural Catholics. And I hope you all admit, they are members of our family. They're not somebody else's children. They're our children. That's one of the advantages of working at the church as a family. 
But how about the last category of people that I want to address? The nuns. Are they outside of the limits of the parish? These are people who are not active in the faith. And they actually, any time they are asked with which religion do you identify, they say none. So that's why they call it nuns. Right. They are not active in their faith. But they do a lot of good things. We shall see that in a second. And then there are people who are theoretically members of the faith, but they don't do a, good, a lot of good things. And so this is a challenge that all of us, all Christians, have to face together. And the World Council of Churches spoke in these terms. Many of our communities face the challenge that some of their members seem to belong without believing while other individuals opt out of the church membership, claiming that they can, without great, with greater authenticity, believe without belonging. The challenge of living our faith as believing communities in such a way that all those who belong are seriously committed Christians, and all who sincerely believe want to belong, is a challenge that we share. It crosses the line which divides us. In other words, all of us have to welcome those who want to belong in the church and those who want to do the good things and we have to revive the faith of those who maybe lost it. So now, let's talk in even greater detail about the nuns. What are their reasons for leaving? And they're leaving in great numbers. In just seven years, from 2007 to 2014, the percentage of unaffiliated among U.S. adults rose from 16.1 to 22.8, making them the fastest growing religious group in America. One more time, who are the fastest growing religious group in America? Those who don't belong to a religion. Why do they leave? They give you two main reasons. The first one, they disagree with the church's teaching. 49% of the nuns say that they do not believe in the sense of being disenchanted with church teaching, considering that their views have evolved and because they went through a crisis of faith. By the way, how many of them actually come to you as clergy persons and say, Father, I'm struggling with the faith? Let's debate. None of them. How many of them say, Father, I really doubt this teaching of the church. Do you have a good book for me to read? Not too many of them. But they have the wrong impression of the faith. Right? And they say, now I disagree with it. If you actually sit down and talk to them, they don't disagree with it. But they have the wrong impression of the faith. And whose fault is it that they have the wrong impression of the faith of the church? Sorry. It's us. We haven't preached well. We haven't taught well. We have to teach well so that people understand that we actually all agree. They don't have crazy views about God. And when I say they, please know that I'm talking about, for example, the students that I love so much. It's a very different world than the Canaan person where I teach and go to the parish. And I have very sincere discussions with my students, many of whom most of whom do not actually go actively into churches. And when we actually sit down and talk, our different views don't differ as much. But in their minds, there's a big difference between the church, what the church says, and what they believe. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that they dislike organized religion. Let me pause right there and tell you that when somebody comes to me and says, I don't like organized religion, my response as an Eastern Orthodox is always, I got a faith for you. <laughs> Have I seen? That was not in my notes. So, under this umbrella, for anti institutional religion, religion, they say that religion focuses on power, on politics, and that religion causes conflict. Important reason why they come. I'm not sure that we like to admit this, but don't you think that oftentimes that's true? That maybe too often we see religious people 
be closely associated with political parties. As if God wants you to be a member of a specific party. Oftentimes, we see religious people supporting all the way the line of the state in its policies. As if the kingdom of God has come with power to the leader of the state. I realize this at all. It's our duty to proclaim it. It happens, doesn't it? So do you wonder why the nuns say, well, you're too close to the line. as bad people because they believe in God. Most of them believe in God. The percentage of atheists among the nuns is very, very small. They make significant life decisions based on their faith. Things like to do in life. They volunteer so they do acts of kindness associated with the kingdom of God, but outside the canonical boundaries of the church. And so, I need to make a few observations about this phenomenon. The first one, I'm sorry to speak critically a little bit about the nuns, but I don't think they thought this through. There is this misconception that one does not need to participate in the life of the church in order to be a good Christian, because faith is only in one side. In other words, it's a very individualistic way of looking at the faith that's all that is important. It's not a community. There is a divorce between spiritual growth and communal worship. I can become better if I meditate, if I pray by myself, if I read my Bible by myself. I don't need to come and sing out of It's an individualistic way of looking at it. The issue that I find most common among my students is that they reduce religion to ethical behavior. They believe that the role of religion is to make ethical people. They can be ethical people without religion. No, no, I don't need religion. And they don't need to say that religion is making unethical people. They are. Christianity offers a significant alternative. And I'm going to speak especially as an orthodox. Because Orthodox theology offers the compelling alternative to this individualistic and fragmented approach to religion in general and to spirituality in particular. The church is a community in which the Lord acts, and not simply the sum of isolated individuals. The church worships God continually and not only privately. The church has a creed shared through all the centuries and through all the world, and not simply personal beliefs that satisfy only one person in the world. The church brings healing to the world by serving those in need communally as opposed to separate individuals. Moreover, spirituality as a personal endeavor finds its fulfillment in the communitarian liturgical aspect of the church. At the same time, the reverse is true. The more each faithful grows in relationship with Christ, the more their spiritual progress creates communion. Thus, the mission of the church addresses not only the individual but also the community. Not only the spirit, but also the body, not only one's immediate context, but the world. The nuns long for this sense of community, communal worship, as well as nourishment and confirmation from a community of faith. A sincere spirituality and study of the Bible might start out individually, but it should lead to the community. Of course, one can be a good person without religion, but one cannot individually have the same level of liturgical life legal tradition and charitable presence as when belonging in the community. In response, the community of the church needs to understand and rectify the reason for the nuns' departure. So from this humbling perspective, the question of the membership of the parish becomes more complicated. Those who believe without belonging actually belong in a real sense. Without having solved the paradox, it is helpful to remember St. Augustine's words. How many sheep are outside? How many wolves? So I would like to say, in conclusion, that St. John Chrysostom wrote that the house is a little church. Indeed, Christian upbringing 
brings begins in the family where the spouses are priests for each other and they dedicate their children to God. As any other family, the church has many types of members. Some are active in their parishes, some have different beliefs, some are only culturally Christian, while others are nuns because they do not belong to any church. In a deeper sense, however, all are members of the large and diverse family that is.
but that those wishful thinking on my part as if people actually pay attention to certain things. I will tell you that I never see the eyes of my parishioners. When I pray, I close my eyes. When I preach, they close their eyes. <laughs> So there's a difference, I think, uh, you're, you're going to something very important, how it should be and how you need this. It's my fault, Tom Brown, and I'm not one. That's why I thought that. Oh, you see? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but in the Roman Catholic Church, it's very, very clear where you do your baptism, where you do your weddings, where you go to Mass. Although with Mass, I've seen among my friends who are Roman Catholic, they are starting to choose a little bit. Um, but, but in terms of sacraments, it's very clear geographical. And it's so 
imperialistic of us to assume that we know what others believe or what others should believe. What we really have to do is to discern the presence of God in our sisters and brothers who are members of the body of Christ and say, what kind of an organ are you, organism are you in this great body? And that transforms us, it makes us better. So this concept of synodality is actually and the essence of the church is that at the core of the church. Without it, we do not speak on behalf of all. As teachers, try to learn as much from our students as we are taught them. Uh, with that challenge as well of developing a communal mindset or communal worldview, you listen to what you just listen to, where do you learn from students in the dialogue? One thing that I learned, so many things that, uh, that I learned from my students. One of them is kindness. I see the transformation where maybe I was just too blind earlier on in my career. I thought I became for 16 years. And um, ever since I came to the game, I assigned, and I'm just giving you one example, there are many, it's not necessarily the most important. But I always assign them to apply Matthew 25 in a way in which they're not interested. In Matthew 25, Jesus says, I was hungry and gave me food. I was thirsty and gave me something to drink. I was in prison and visited me. I was sick. He ministered to me. And so, some of the things that these students are doing initially, I had this impression 16 years ago that four or five of them were doing these things very naturally. And the other ones did it for credit and they enjoyed it and they go, yes, I'm definitely going to do this again. But so it's a beautiful thing in the end. But nowadays when I when I ask students to apply, they tell me things like ever since I moved to Pittsburgh, I started uh, volunteering at the case one hospital. Sometimes children are abandoned there. My job as a volunteer is to hold those babies. Another person says, I miss my grandmother. I live far away from my grandmother. And I decided to volunteer to a nursing home. I go, we do puzzles, we read the newspaper. And all of them seem to be doing these things. And so, Father, what my students are teaching me. If I had one word to describe this generation of students that I teach you now, it would be generosity. Support what you what you just said. Did you notice the main reason why people convert? That's where I find find spiritual fulfillment. That's where I find peace. That's where I agree with the teachings. At least as a theologian, forgive me. It should be the other way around. These people convinced me, <laughs> right? <laughs> they turned around and said, "Peace be with you," and I found the peace. <laughs> so, so it, it seems to me that this should be the spiritual marketplace. It's not my expression. I can say, oh, uh, 
It literally is a spiritual marketplace. And I'm sorry, yes, they shop around for churches based on uh, music and so forth. I don't think we have an alternative other than to respond to those needs initially. And my principle as a priest has always been, I'm not as interested in why you're here, but now that you're here, let me see what I can do to you. Sometimes people come to church because they're a and brother. Sometimes it was really grandma made them come. Like sometimes that we have a baby and I heard that I need to baptize the baby. Jesus said to go to the lakes of the city. I'm not going to the lakes of the city. I'm staying in an air conditioned space with my beautiful white vestments that never have a stain on them. And these people are coming to me. Don't they have a, a, a duty? So it comes from individualism. But that's when the conversion can happen. And I have noticed how, at least in my parish, and I speak very highly, okay, we joke before, but I'm telling you, I speak very highly of my parish because I am the assistant and on the senior priest. My main job is to became the senior priest, the parish council, the people in the leadership of the parish, and those who do ministries, they are the ones that make it the kingdom of God there. And I ask people, why did you come? Why did you say when people convert to Orthodox? They generally come for two reasons. One, I looked in history and I wanted to find the church of the New Testament. Two, I love icons. It's the aesthetic. But then when you ask, why are you saying it? That's the answer. Look at this community. That's a transformation which is a little bit countercultural. Let's admit it, right? I am an American citizen. Later in life I became an American citizen. I'm very proud of my American activity. I'm going to be home in Romania soon and uh, I can see my parents already. Oh, the Americans are here. But you know, the Americans are here. So, our American strength can also sometimes be our American weakness. It seems to me that individualism can be a great strength if you say, I'm alone. Nobody's helping me, but I refuse to give up.
basic unit of society is always the family. And as that has kind of begun to disintegrate in the country, the country is beginning to disintegrate. If we don't build that back up, you know, the country will fall apart. That's true of any nation or empire or city. The family is the core unit that holds the society together. And our role, I guess, is that we can't undo what's going to happen in American culture. But what the church does is it kind of supports that need that people have to be together. And as you go out into the parishes after you get out of the seminary, you become your family. And, and you just kind of look around the streets and the parties are wild. And you never see kids out in the neighborhood playing. You know, they just kind of stay inside and watch people. Kind of, just kind of in the core of their family, they just have that. And if that's not real really solid, they really have no way of uh, being formed, you know, in terms of morality and, and, and kind of living within society. And the more you know, important issue of their spirituality just doesn't develop. So you have to do those things. If you're the primary mover, and you've got to be somebody that can give a decent homily on Sunday. <laughs> And you do have to have a good cantor, and you do have to have a children's program, or you will die. And that is in the case of any church in the United States today. And the programs that we do to provide that, do provide that place of the family, and kind of build that community of God that is just at the core of being Christian, and being whether you're Orthodox or Protestant or Catholic. And it is what makes us a church, and brings us closer. Okay, so let's close up with the...